my last update, I talked about my attempt at hand laying track and what a fail that was. However, and there's always a however in life, I did take another whack at it on the final section of the brewery with considerably better results, and as a bonus, solved the staging yard problem all in one shot. I was planning to use commercial track and turnouts for the 8 foot extension to Two Creeks, and it would have worked just fine, but with nearly a dozen turnouts on the shopping list it was going to really eat up the budget. In the meantime, I had plenty of wooden ties, plenty of spikes, and a bit of unusable flex track salvaged from the old modules. So I started laying the plain sections of the yard, figuring I could at least get something done and use up the rail from what was left of my old track. As this progressed, I also started watching videos on how to lay turnouts on the Fast Tracks website. And the more I watched, the more I was certain that I could at least hammer out the turnouts I needed to finish the track work. To that end, I ordered a few frets of copperhead switch ties and at least one set of crossover ties, as well as some wooden switch ties from Fast Tracks. Now, if I were to do this railroad all over again and had to lay all of the track from the start, I would have invested in all of the turnout jigs and shaping tools that they offer, knowing that by the time I had built the 30 or so turnouts needed, I would have saved quite a bit of coin versus doing it with the prefab components. Perhaps on my next large layout this will be the case. For this railroad's purpose, most of that had already been done, and what remained were, were a mere 8 switches, which I had pared down from 11 by eliminating a crossover and an unnecessary service track access. The remainder of the list was four each of left hand and right hand number sixes, although one of those was changed a bit as well. As for the formation of these parts in the absence of machined jigs, I used a micro-engineering number six to establish a diagram onto a slab of plywood for both left and right hand versions, and then used micro-engineering HO spikes to fasten the copper ties in the correct lengths and locations to this base. After that, I laid the straight stock rail, followed by the frog point rails, the straight frog closure rail, the curved stock rail, and finally the curved frog closure rail. The order of these things is not by accident. Since this is being done sans jig, all of the rail positions had to be gauged from that first stock rail. The frog point location would set the location of the straight closure rail and also the gauge and location of the curved stock rail since the frog points were soldered together and had to move as one unit and so on. I soldered everything together including guard rails before moving on to the points. I also made sure that I had cut the proper gaps in the PC board tie surfaces and run an electrical isolation test over the entire thing before removing it from the slab. I should also mention that I did not solder the head blocks in at this point, as I needed to cut out the insides of the stock rails to accept points. As an aside, this is one of those areas where some of the forming tools from Fast Tracks would have really helped. Since I was trying to be thrifty about all this, I ended up doing it the hard way and forming all of my points and cutouts by hand and eyeball. I should also note that this method of fitting points to stock rails is not prototypical. One reason for the failure of my last attempt was that I tried to do it according to the prototype practice where the points are shaped to fit against a solid stock rail. Unfortunately, this requires a great deal of precision and accuracy, and if anyone is interested in making turnouts with this kind of accuracy, I would suggest Oak Hill Model Track Supply for this. Jeff Otto has appeared a couple of times on Ken Patterson's show to demonstrate how the Oak Hill system works, and it seems well worth the effort for the level of fidelity you get from these parts. Moving along, after the points were cut and fit, I joined them to the closure rails with half a rail joiner. I made this by taking a small X-Acto saw to an Atlas Code 100 83 rail joiner and carefully slicing it in half. It only takes a few gentle drags with the saw before it bottoms out on the flat part of the joiner, at which point it can be flexed in half. I soldered the joiner to the closure rail with just enough solder to make the joint without flooding the empty side. After that, the points were installed and soldered to a throw bar made of gapped PC board tie. The head blocks were then soldered in, trapping the points in place despite their loose fit in the joints. One final electrical and gauge check and it was ready to install. To make sure the ties were all in the right place, I set the soldered turnout where I wanted it to go, making sure everything was lined up, and then marked the locations of all the soldered ties. With these as a guide, I laid switch ties as needed in between these marked areas, leaving me with a nice bed of ties to spike the switch to, while making room for the already installed ones. Turnout control in this section is a bit of a departure from the rest of the layout. 
If cost saving is the goal, another eight tortoise machines at 21 bucks each is not the way to do that. To say nothing of making sure there's a spot for each one under the table. This section of the layout is actually a pair of four foot modules bolted together, so there's a lot more going on under there than if I had done a simple eight footer. Instead, I made some simple over center springs to hold the points in alignment, which seems to do the trick for now. What I can't use with this particular yard ladder are Caboose Industries ground throws, as there just isn't enough room for them between the ladder track and the northernmost shop track. The primary function of this end of the yard anyway is to allow an escape for the locomotives when they are bringing in a train, so I really didn't feel the need to install anything more sophisticated. Another thing that I ended up doing because of that joint between two four-footers, not wanting to put a turnout across that joint, I had to adjust the track plan a bit and make one of those number sixes a number seven and move it a little farther back, hoping for the shallower angle to maintain the track flow. It worked okay, though to tell the truth I have seen similar misalignments on the prototype, and this is the bitter end of a secondary spur in the early 70s at best. So there are still a lot of ties to be laid down as of this video in order to complete the service and shop tracks, but I did have enough leftover material for a rather special bit of track work, and quite an ambitious one considering I had only just started making my own track. I had been doodling with the idea of making a lap switch to feed the staging yard tracks, as well as taking the staging yard down to three tracks instead of four. Uh, all of this would make it a little easier to handle cars in that narrow space, and I could avoid the cost of getting those curved turnouts that I mentioned before. I laid out the geometry using a number 10 for the diverging middle route, and a number 6 for the far left hand route, set just behind the points of the number 10. This would give me a left handed three way turnout that fit just right into the space I had at the top of the staging yard. Laying this bit of track would take a bit of trial and error, but one of the benefits of soldering together a turnout is that any mistakes can be easily reheated and corrected. The tougher part would be getting the electrical isolation right. In the end, I made two of the frogs into one single electrical unit as they are right next to each other and they only need to switch polarity when the far left route is used. Since this part is off the model portion of the layout, I used ground throws and the double frog is switched manually. One correction I had to make to this was to move the gap in one of the rails further towards the points. The initial gap here was too close to an opposite rail and had a tendency to short out, even when the cars with metal wheels were passing through. I simply desoldered the offending parts and made new ones with the correct gap spacing. So satisfied that all the hard construction worked well, I wired everything to the main track bus and got back to running trains, and I'll talk more about that next time. Thanks for watching. So back in the 90s, I first heard Tony Custer use the term play value in describing the amount of time we spend with the hobby and how much we're getting out of it. Now it certainly applies when it comes to hand laying track. Yes. It is quicker and perhaps in a lot of ways easier to just slam down some commercially available track, take your ready to roll engines out of the box, throw them down, and kind of get on with things. If the overall goal is uh, getting the layout finished and getting it operational and actually getting to operations, I see no problem with that. Um, however, one thing I found in this whole uh, track laying adventure of mine is that while it's TDM squared, um, it is certainly a very rewarding experience once everything is done. Uh, kind of coming up against these problems and then overcoming them is actually very rewarding. And uh, that's why I think I would certainly consider building an entire layout using hand laid track. You know, I used to think, my God, how could anybody spend that much time and effort to do something the size of the Allegheny Midland with hand laid track? But if you've got the time and, uh, you're willing to put in the effort it's uh it's certainly something you're not going to get out of commercial track that's uh you consider a left-handed double three-way a double left-handed three-way turnout how many of those you're going to find on the shelf and if you do manage to find one how much is it going to cost you i built mine for free using leftover components from uh the rest of the track laying project which by the way um i think i saved about two-thirds of the cost uh, hand laying just because of the number of switches involved and not buying any special tools or jigs I saved quite a bit of money 
<clears throat> in terms of what it would cost to lay lay all that track. Um, straight sections of track, I figure it kind of balances out. It's about um, two dollars a foot on average. It's the cost of using flex track or hand laying straight track. Um, so there's not a lot of cost savings there. But when you start making switches, especially complex switches like three ways or you know, if you're really feeling adventurous doing uh, slip crossings and stuff like that, that's where you're really going to save your bacon. Um, and if you watch um, the videos that are on Fast Tracks and um, some of the other stuff that Tim has on there, you'll see that you can do some really amazing track work, um, you know, just built by hand. So this was uh, certainly a great little adventure. Um, of course, it's representing quite a bit of progress on the railroad because I'm almost done laying track and everything is operational now so I want to get into that on the next video because I've actually been doing some work towards the operational end of this and that'll tie up a couple of things I've been struggling with lately so that'll be the next video that was this video and thanks for watching see you next time